requires it that they'll even kill you. Uh, not naturally. Well, some people may kill you naturally or try to do it over titles and positions. So we're getting ready to do that. And uh, listen, we are live on Periscope as well as Facebook. Please invite somebody to be on the line with us as we move into this wonderful, uh, wonderful subject matter. Um, we're just excited about the opportunity every week to come before you. And uh, we don't ask you for any type of financial donations or anything like that. As a matter of fact, people that do that need to be very careful when it comes to the uh, IRS, when it comes to the government, um, as far as taxes are concerned. Uh, so we don't ask for donations. We just simply ask that you please share uh, the video with your family and friends. Don't forget that you can also go to um, uh, YouTube and you can go to my YouTube channel. Is that a little bit better? There we go. You can go to my YouTube channel and on my YouTube channel, you will be able to um, see some of the uh, previous uh, teachings that we've done. Last week, I had a tremendous presenter and welcome to each and every one of you, Sister Battles, Evangelist Good, uh, Prophet Mickles. That's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, bless you, uh, Regional President Bowles. Uh, Pastor Mickles, Prophet Mickles, Administrative Assistant Mickles, he was on the line with us on last week, and uh, he did a wonderful job presenting about uh, how to know the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. Did an excellent job, and we're so glad that he was our guest presenter on last week. We have other presenters that we will be sharing with you in the future as we continue to share these live teachings on Tuesday night. Uh, I didn't really have a title for these teachings, but we call them, somebody called them Tuesday Night Live, so we've just gone with that. So listen, do me a favor, Evangelist uh, J. Emmanuel Obi, who is doing a fabulous job with college ministry. Man, I see souls getting saved, sick bodies healed. Uh, Brother Jacobs, God bless you. Elder Davis, thank you so much for being with me on Sunday. I have four preaching engagements on Sunday. I made it through each and every one of them. And uh, I'm excited about all of what God is doing uh, for the future here in the city of St. Louis, across the country and around the world. We're on the verge of revival, saints. I tell you, God is moving. He is healing. He is delivering. He is setting free. And I'm not just talking about an emotional high. I'm talking about we're literally seeing the lame walk. We're seeing uh, people with physical conditions getting healed of those physical conditions. I do this because there was a lady in New York a few weeks ago, couldn't move this uh, arm. She couldn't walk and she was just running and jumping and praising God because God had healed her body. This coming weekend, I will be heading to Louisville, Kentucky on Friday night. If Administrative Assistant Gabriel Hatcher is on the line, he will share with you the exact address of the church. But Louisville, Kentucky, I'm heading your way Friday night for those of you that are watching on October the 23rd, 2018. And then Sunday morning, Sunday morning, we will be at the world-renowned Temple of Deliverance, Church of God in Christ, pastored by Bishop Hawkins, Bishop Milton Hawkins there in Memphis, Tennessee, founded by the late, great evangelist, Bishop Apostle G.E. Patterson. Yes, there is an evangelism manual. We will have those available at the Holy Convocation. But listen, tell someone that we're on the line now. We're going to be talking about why is it that church people will kill you ostracize you, talk about you, put you down because of positions. They will try to kill your reputation. They will connive. They will stab you in the back. They will lie. They will do all of these kind of things. Remember the songwriter said, I've been lied on, cheated, talked about, mistreated. Yes, we're praying for St. Paul. Oh, you lost two members. Oh my goodness. We're praying for your congregation. Everybody, please pray for the St. Paul church family. They've lost two members and they're asking for prayer on uh, Periscope. And of course, we have dealt with some major, major, major losses here in the St. Louis area. Uh, I don't want to say loss, L-O-S-T, but L-O-S-S, -S, loss as far as their presence being with us. The late great presiding bishop, Charles, uh, not Charles, but um, Chandler David Owens always used to teach that if someone is saved, they're not lost, L-O-S-T. There's just a loss in the sense that their presence is gone uh, from you. But uh, Bishop R.J. Ward, my former prelate, went home to be with the Lord. Pastor Abel Brown, who was a um, historic Church of God in Christ pastor here in town, went home to be with the Lord. And today, and today, and today, the Superintendent Shelley Howard, who uh, the Lord used tremendously to win so many people to Christ, passed away and went home to be with the Lord. He is the one that made frame famous the phrase, Good morning, Jesus. Now, for those of you outside of the St. Louis area, you have good morning, Jesus. What does that mean? It's afternoon, it's evening. 
Good morning, Jesus basically means this. They would hold service back in the day <clears throat> until well after midnight, sometime two o'clock in the morning, sometime till sunrise. And then once the sun began to, began to come up, and especially Pastor Shelley Howard and his services, they never got out before midnight. That could be just a regular revival service. And after the clock struck midnight, they would say, good morning, Jesus. And they would stay in church just to say that. And I mean, the place would go up. Tons of people have been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost uh, through his ministry. So I ask that you please continue to pray uh, for that family. Tonight at Live Center, I teach Bible study as soon as I leave out from the live. So please join us in Bible study when you get a chance. If you're here in the St. Louis area, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to be dealing <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to be dealing with this um, controversy. And a lot of you have been asking me about this, about this um, sermon that has gone forth about um, uh, God. Um, well, I didn't want to say it that way, but um, uh, so and so and so on the devil, so and so on the devil. I'll just say it that way. Of course, when people in my generation say so and so, that means that's filling in a phrase for a cuss word. And there was a uh, preacher that preached a message in regard to the devil being condemned. And so he didn't use the word condemned. He said, um, God, so and so and so, the devil. We're going to be dealing with that tonight in our Bible study because I believe it's a good place for discussion. A lot of these are learning experiences. And also pay attention to my blog. I have something on uh, that'll be coming on in regard to that as well. Let's pray and go into the word. Father, I thank you for this glorious and blessed opportunity that you've given me to share the word with so many people. Bless us now as we go in your word and we'll give you the thanks and the honor in Jesus name. Thank God. Amen. Can all people say amen. God bless you, Carolyn Coleman. Amen. Bless you, Superintendent Courtney Sanders. Great preacher. Bless you, Takitha Peterson Carter. God bless your heart. Uh, Charles Chavez Jr. God bless you, sir. Very uh, distinguished name. Amen. Minister Warlick, Elder Stephen Cooper, all the way from Tacoma, Washington, my home city. Amen. As Pastor and AIM Chairman uh, Cedric Smith from Chicago. Amen. The one and only Pastor Andre Johnson. Thank you so much for all of you that are tuned in. And I will take questions at the end. If you have a question, kind of hold that till about... Um, uh, well, I won't say what time, but kind of hold that till towards the end, you know, kind of when I'm wrapping up, uh, then I want you to uh, share your questions and comments. So why is this? Why is this? Why is this that church people fight so much over titles and uh, positions? Many of us that are in the church have experienced overbearing, uh, rude people, uh, mean individuals uh, that have literally been power hungry. And they've sought to exert their authority over us in the church so that we could know exactly who they are and what position they hold and how important they are. Um, we've experienced that. People talk about uh, church hurt. And I'm not too quick to use that term church hurt because all of us are people, <clears throat> excuse me, and all of us are faulty. I know some of y'all are worried I'm, I'm, I'm clearing my throat and everything. I don't have water this time. I am so sorry. I have my trusted anointed uh coke zero my god hallelujah don't you wish that you had some refreshing coke zero they said have a coke and a smile my god i have a coke and a smile and i got the anointing of the holy ghost no water tonight but uh if anything <laughs> if anything comes up i got my big bottle of israeli blessed oil this came straight from uh the holy land from around mount Hermon. so if anything happens i got my coca-cola and my uh, blessed oil so i'll be okay thank you for your prayers but all of us have experienced that. I don't like to use that term church hurt a whole lot because to be honest, Minister Betts, um, some of us may have hurt people in the church. And we always talk about how we've been hurt, but all of us are people. The church is made up of people. And <laughs> bless you, Bishop, designate hell. Yes, sir, pray for me. You're one of the most tremendous preachers and organists in the entire world. I appreciate your ministry. Um, so we've hurt people as well. So if we've heard people as well, we need to kind of give each other a break and not be so hard on people and focus so much on um, church hurt. You're going to get hurt any place. You're going to get hurt in the church. You're going to get hurt on your job. Now, why is it that it seems like church hurt, um, it, it stings so bad? And when people try to exert authority and try to get positions and titles and hurt you, why does it seem like it crushes you so much? The reason why is because, I don't know, it's somewhat of a misnomer, I would say, about church. I don't tell people to do that. Um, what we tell people to do a lot of times is put your guard down, put the walls down, and just let go and let God have his way. 
Um, I don't put my guard down in any church, and I'm very funny who it is that lays hands on me. I'm very funny who speaks into my life. I'm very funny who prophesies to me. I'm not going to give you any complimentary falls if you lay hands on me. Uh, power of God hits me. Yes, I'm going to hit the floor. Uh, but um, if it's not the power of God, I'm not going to fall just to make you um, look good because then I fall out. It's no telling what kind of spirit I can take on. Um, you speak into my life and say all kind of things that are not like God. Uh, bless you, Bishop Rudolph, our adjutant general of the Church of God in Christ. Um, I can't say, uh, you know, what kind of spirit you take on, you know, somebody laying hands on you and speaking into your life and all. So I'm very careful about that. And so one reason why people uh, get hurt in church so bad is because they have this utopian view of church that everybody's saved there and it's just wonderful. And even for those of you in this generation, when you hear us talk about the good old days, let me tell you what, I came from the good old days. The scripture says, how many of you left, are left among you that saw this house in its first glory and how do you see it now? Um, I saw the glory. I saw the glory. Bishop Rudolph, we've seen the glory. You're from Arkansas. My late pastor, Bishop Westbrook, was from Arkansas. These were consecrated people that loved God. And yes, they loved God with all their heart, soul, and being saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. But there's never been a time in the church from the time of Jesus up until now when things were just absolutely perfect. You know, as you go through life and as you get older, uh, you find comfort in selective memory. You find comfort, bless you all the way from Michigan, uh, you find comfort in um, nostalgic moments from years ago. Um, and so you could have lived 40 years, 50 years, 60, 70 years, whatever. You don't focus on everything in your life, but you look back and think on those good moments. And so as a result of that, it makes it seem like you know, everything back in the day was just perfect. I can tell you everything was not perfect. There was church hurt back then. There were people 40 years ago that were doing everything they wanted to do. Um, times are different now because you have social media. You can't just uh, kind of hide away. The culture has changed. I was raised by the great generation and the great generation, especially in the black community. Many of those people, I, I'm just, this is just me talking. So you all, you all know me. I'm, I'm very, um, I have etiquette in how I talk. I'm, I'm um, very careful in how I talk, but, you know, I can be kind of straightforward as well. Uh, so let me just say it this way without cutting any corners. In the black community, black people of the older generation were conditioned by white people. And uh, white people had conditioned them through racism and Jim Crow laws that if uh, the white man had done something bad against you, keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything about it. You know, white man rapes a black woman back then, whatever, just keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything about that. We don't talk about those particular type of things. And unfortunately, that Jim Crow mentality crept its way into the church. And so that's why there were just certain things you just didn't talk about. You knew certain things went on. You know, so-and-so slept with someone else. You looked at so-and-so that that child doesn't look like, you know, mother so-and-so. Um, but... Um, you know, you just kept, you, shut up, boy. You know, they tell you to shut up, keep your mouth closed. You just were quiet, you moved on. We're a different generation now. This generation uh, wants to converse. If there's a pink elephant with uh, purple polka dots in the room, they don't want you to ignore it. They want you to acknowledge it. So the culture has changed. People have not changed. People, watch this, have been people ever since Adam and Eve. So don't think that there's something all of a sudden new. You know, young people will get, reach a certain age hit puberty and think all of a sudden they've discovered sex. Well, do you realize how you got here? And do you realize that people have been having sex for thousands of, of years? It's nothing brand new. And so people think that because there's church hurt, because there's mess, because so-and-so was doing this, you know, this is something new. Things have been going on, but we're not in church for people. We're in church because the Lord saved us and he put us in the church. You know, that's why we say you can't join in. You got to be born in. We're born again and we're born into the church, which is the family of God. This is the family that God has put us in. And when it comes to your natural family, you know, you're born into it and it is what it is. Even if you're adopted into another family, if you never see your mother or daddy, you know, you have DNA. And so we are in the church and the church is not perfect. Now, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. And uh, Elder Hosmer, I'm trying to figure out how that's gonna happen, but it's not for me to figure out. He's going to do it. Now, I do know the Bible lets us know in 1 John chapter 3, verse three, 
Beloved, now we the sons of God and doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall see him, uh, for we shall, uh, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so I believe that there will be a tremendous work of transition and transformation that takes place. But many of us must admit it. There are times in church life where you get discouraged, you get despondent, uh, you get to the point you feel like, hey, I'd be better off just sitting at home, reading my Bible and uh, watching Christian television, watching, you know, preaching on the Internet and all, instead of getting involved in the um, matters of dealing with people in church. Because when you deal with people in church, you're going to get hurt. It's just a part of life. It's just a part of the church experience. And I want to be realistic with that because many times we paint the wrong picture to people and people have this wrong view about church. Um, they have this wrong view that they're never going to be hurt. Everyone is just wonderful. I don't teach people that. Again, I teach people, keep your guard up. Be careful who lays hands on you. Be careful who's, um, like I was taught, be careful whose table you eat from. Now, that sounds kind of strange. What does that mean? Uh, when we were coming along, we couldn't go to everybody's church. You know, it's different now. It's more of an ecumenical day. Everybody runs to everyone's service. And what happens, even in the natural, if you eat from too many places, you're going to end up getting sick because everyone doesn't have the same hygiene. Uh, some people, their kitchen is not dirty. We had a lady uh, in one church in the state of Washington where I came up. Uh, she dipped snuff. And so she would spit in her kitchen sink. And so when she would make her apple pies and all that for the church dinners, um, she would take her seasoning and her flour and her apples and all that kind of stuff. And she'd do all that stuff in her kitchen sink and then put it together, put it in the pie crust and bake it. Oh, you should have heard them church people. I ain't eating so-and-so's um, pies or nothing from their kitchen because uh, she dips snuff. And so everybody doesn't have the same hygiene. So you really shouldn't run to everybody's church, even if it's in the same denomination. That doesn't mean nothing because, you know, if the denominational title says something on the wall. Don't you realize there's all kind of people putting up all kind of names nowadays. I have before me Coke Zero. And some of you are old enough to remember when Coca-Cola, the original Coca-Cola said, we are going to get a new formula and we're putting out the old formula. Folks had a fit. So they had to go back to the old formula and they called it Coca-Cola Classic. It's still a little different, but they call it Coke Classic. Then they came up with all kind of stuff. Coke Zero, Coke Vanilla, Coke Lime, you know, Coke Lemon, all kinds of things, Diet Coke and, and, and all of that. Um, it's the same way when it comes to the faith. You know, I am Church of God in Christ to the bone. But you cannot just go on the title Church of God in Christ on the outside of the wall. Oh, I went to that church and it says Church of God in Christ. All right, which one? You got Church of God in Christ Memphis. You got Church of God in Christ International. You got United Church of God in Christ, Church of God in Christ United, Church of God in Christ Apostolic, True Church of God in Christ, you know, Church of God in Christ Congregational. There's tons of different groups that use that title, and there's some people that will deceptively just let you know, oh, yeah, yeah, we Church of God in Christ, uh, but you need to find out, okay, which one. So just going by a title on the wall doesn't really mean anything. You should investigate when it comes to your soul. When it comes to your soul, be careful who preaches into your life. Do investigation. I don't mind you investigating me. Don't just take my word for it because I'm here on Tuesday nights and you think, okay, Hankerson is a nice person, seems like he's a nice guy and I can trust him and all of that. I teach our people at Lightener and I've taught the last 25 years of pastoring. You better know God for yourself. It is not my responsibility to get you to be devoted to me. It's not my responsibility to get you committed to me. The late Bishop Charles Harrison Mason taught preachers, your job is to get the people to God. The reason why God moved and sent leadership was because of his people. And I taught that a couple of weeks ago in the lesson. Listen to what it says in the book of Exodus, you know, because we focus on leaders so much until we forget, really, God is concerned about his people. God said, I heard the cry of my people. He didn't say, I heard the cry of Moses. He didn't say, Moses, I heard what you had to say. I heard the cry of my people, and now I'm, I'm sending you. I'm sending good, godly leadership to bring my people out. And that's what leadership is all about. So when it comes to titles and positions and things like that, the heart of those of us that are in leadership should be to get the people to God, not to get the people devoted to us. We're only going to be here a few years. You know, we're out of here. That's it. I'll be here another few years, and, you know, hopefully I'll live to be 100. Love to do that. 
And, um, you know, that would be fine and great. But if the Lord delays his coming and time continues to move on, all of us have to leave here one day. And so the people cannot be so devoted to us. They have to be devoted to Jesus because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, when it comes to talking about titles and positions, um, a lot of people that are in laity think it's totally strange. And we must understand there's one Lord, there's one faith, and there's one baptism, Ephesians chapter 4. One God, one Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. Bless you, Brother Johnson. I appreciate that. Um, but there is uh, ministry gifts, Ephesians 4, 11, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And then also there's administrations, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so there are people that God places in leadership. Now, as far as God sees it, we're all together. Uh, some of us come from more hierarchical uh, religious organizations or denominations. For example, the Church of God in Christ, the Methodist Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and many other organizations are hierarchical. And so there is a clear distinction between uh, clergy and laity. Um, and that even is... Um, demonstrated we have our adjutant general that's on the line that's demonstrated many times even in our ecclesiastical attire then there's other um religious organizations where they say all of us are on the same level for example uh the baptist church now, i know elder rogers that there are uh people that are consecrated now as bishops in the baptist church but the original charter you could say or teaching of the baptist church is that all members are equal so the, the, the preacher is not above anyone else and so one person, one vote. And so it's congregational. A lot of that has changed over the years, but just those are differences in government. But anyways, for people that are laity, a lot of that sounds really strange when you talk about titles and positions. What does that have to do with my salvation? Well, you must understand for those that are called to the fivefold ministry, for those that have administrative gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, um, ministry, church is more than just showing up at church on Sunday morning and leaving out and that's it. Ministry is literally our life. Um, this is our job. This is what we do. And so for many people, that's hard to understand. But again, let's, ex let's exchange roles a little bit, okay? Again, as a lay person, you show up at church when you want to, you don't want to, hey, fine. You don't go, if you get up Sunday morning, say, I don't feel like going to church, fine. You just don't go if you're not on volunteer staff. Um, that's it, you know, and you show up, you can walk in when you get ready, leave out when you get ready, pay your tithes if you want to, pay them if you don't pay them if you don't want to, uh, depending on the um, structure of your church. Uh, it's, it's almost, I don't want to say a free for all, but it's not all as much accountability. Now, there should be accountability, but in the time that we're in, people are not really accountable to too much of anything marriages, churches, jobs, family not much of anything, and that's how people approach church. But when you are in full-time ministry, when you are a pastor of a church, when you are a bishop or a leader, um, I cannot just get up on Sunday and say, hmm, I don't feel like going to church today, let me stay home. It affects so many people, because number one, this is my job. It's not just my faith, it's also my job. And so with my job, I am supposed to show up prepared and ready. And so when it comes to your job as a lay person, um, you, many people don't want to stay at the same level. Some people want to move up the ladder. You want to get the corner office. So put yourself in a minister's shoes. There are many ministers that this is our life. This is our role. And there are many ministers that want to aspire to um, greater jobs, more responsibility. For example, you may have pastors that uh, want to become bishops. That's wrong, Hankerson. Why would they want to become a Bishop, well, have you read the word? First Timothy uh, chapter three says, if a man desire the office of a bishop. So there's some people that there's a desire there. And of course, uh, a bishop there means overseer. Um, and so literally Paul says, you desire a good work. There's just certain qualifications that you have to meet. So there's nothing wrong with that. Here's what I wanna say. There's nothing wrong with titles and positions in themselves. But there is something wrong when you're so insecure that you will want to destroy other people for a title. There is something wrong when the title becomes who you are. I am a bishop in the Lord's church. I'm a pastor of a local congregation. I'm a denominational uh, uh, executive. 
but that is not my name and that is not who I am. And therefore, when the time comes for me to retire, don't throw rocks at me because uh, I do have a retirement date that I will have uh, one day because I do not want to be um, in ministry in a point where I can't serve, where I can't function, but I'm just holding an office because of the prestige of it or because I want the check or whatever, and I'm not even able to function. I don't even know what my name is and all of that. Um, I want to be able at a certain time to uh, turn things over and move forward and advise. And you, once a preacher, always a preacher. You're never going to get out of that, you know, but you don't always have to have a certain position or a certain title. My position is not who I am. Bishop is not who I am. Pastor is not who I am. I am a child of God. And my importance comes from uh, what Jesus did for me on the cross. And so um, I was confident in who I was, um, you know, long, long, long before titles and all of that. Yeah, then it becomes selfish ambition. So we should never be into to selfish ambition. This is all about glorifying him. I thank God for this season of my life that I'm in. I'm honored to be in this season. I count it a privilege to be in this season, but my position and title does not make me. I, I thank God for the title and position, and I try to uh, live up to the standard of the position. And not only that, I try to make sure that the standard and the position has a good name. Uh, when you say a bishop, a bishop should mean something. That should mean something. It shouldn't be, oh, the bishop is coming. Okay, which one? You know, oh, yeah, that joker. You know, it shouldn't be like that. It should be when you say the bishop is coming, there should be some kind of respect. That's our pastor. There should be some kind of respect. So what I try to do I tell my kids all the time, I try to maintain a good name. A good name is above anything else. When your name can mean something, saints, when your name can mean something, then the title of position is almost just like an additive uh, to that. If the meat is seasoned just right and, and has our, everything that it's supposed to have, then the sauce just adds to it. And so titles and positions are really the sauce that adds to it, but to have a good name, to have strong character, that's really what makes the difference. And so when we focus on that, then you end up making the title. You end up making the position, not it making you. If you do not know who you are in Christ and don't realize how important you are to him and you're not confident in who he's made you to be, and you think by getting a title or position, it's going to make you something more, um, you're in for a rude awakening because, hello, wake up, it's 2018. And people could care less about titles. They do not, you know, I'm the bishop. And, you know, they don't care about this. Sit down like everybody else. You know, that's how it is in this day and time, because so many people have uh, made a mockery of offices in the church that people just don't have that respect. A lot of people out on the street, they don't have respect for preachers. A lot of folks in the church don't have respect for preachers because there's just so much that has been going on. Like I said, it's been happening all along. Uh, ever since the time of Christ, Jesus had the disciples fighting over positions and all kinds of things. But there's always been a witness. God has always been a witness. And that's why it's important for those that are real witnesses to stand up, speak up. You know, don't sit back and, and, and be quiet. Make some noise. You know, let your voice be heard. Be a witness. You know, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Speak forth and then uh, God can uh, bountifully bless. So there is nothing wrong. I want to make this plain here. There's what's wrong, Evangelist Sanders, talk to me. There's nothing wrong with titles or positions, but when you get to the point that they have you or you're insecure and you're trying to get them to seem more important, then something is wrong. You've got to know who you are in Christ. And then as opportunities come forth, you're like, hey, you know, God has blessed me and gifted me with um, these particular talents and abilities to bring to the table. And I want to Utilize that to serve the people and to benefit the kingdom of God. Yeah, titles are so watered down. Elder Dennis Morgan, who is on the line right now, his granddad was my late uh, pastor, Bishop T.L. Westbrook. He was actually a state bishop over the entire state of Washington. You're talking about a man that carried such respect. He, he carried and demanded respect by the life that he lived. And so that's the teaching that I come up under and come from. And that's why I see Bishop Nelson wants to be an example of that kind of teaching. Now, fighting over titles, fighting over positions, it actually started in heaven. Can you believe that? Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14, where it talks about the morning star, talking about Lucifer. 
How you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in throne on the mount of the assembly of the, up high, of the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend upon the top of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. All right, that started in heaven. Can you imagine that? Um, and, and that's a whole theological discussion in itself because we would picture heaven as, um, yeah, oh yeah, God bless you, Vanda Sanders. I appreciate that. Yay, Brother Lambert, one, one of our New Jerusalemites. Elder Tyler, also my Sunday school superintendent here at Live Center. Um, when I think of heaven, I think of peace and, and, and quietness and all of that, you know, People are telling me now, Hankerson, you preached uh, uh, so much on Sunday. You're heading here. You're heading there. You're traveling all around the country. You're over the coalition and evangelism, the church and the jurisdiction. You need to get some rest. I was taught that you rest when you get to heaven. So all of you people, evangelist, Sister Young and Bishop McCarter, up here talking about when you get to heaven, you're going to sing and shout and, and all that kind of stuff. And you're going to walk around heaven all day. Please stay away from me. Please do that. Hankerson, why would you say something like that? Because I'm going to rest when I get to heaven. And my family will tell you, when I want to rest, I want it quiet. I don't want no noise. So I don't need you beating no tambourines. <laughs> beating the tambourines. I'm at the world you just came from and walking around heaven, keeping up all kind of noise on the streets of gold. Please go to another section and let me be in another section. I want to see Jesus and I'm going to rest in the presence of the Lord. That's when I'm going to rest. And so those that want to make noise, I'm sure there'll be a noise section. Some of you tell me, when I've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, I'm going to be praising God's name and shouting all over God's heaven. I'm going to want it quiet once I get to heaven. But can you imagine, and that's just a little facetious, but can you imagine getting into heaven and there's a fight taking place? There's a fight taking place, and that's literally what happened, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Now, I know some of you look at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, well, Hankerson, that's talking about some earthly kings, but when you study those texts, you will see that there are supernatural qualities that are literally attributed, attributed to these individuals, which lets you know this was someone that was not just a natural-born king. This was somebody that was supernatural. And Lucifer literally said, I'm going to raise my throne above the stars of God. It was a power struggle. I'm not satisfied being the anointed chair of Ezekiel chapter 28. But I literally want all the accolades that God has. I want everything that he has. I didn't know that. Bless you, Bishop McCarter. McCarter. Um, and so he took that mentality and infiltrated it into humanity. Now, I know some of you go to Genesis chapter 3 and you say, well, I don't see nothing in there referring to the devil. So how can you say that the serpent was the devil? Well, what you have to do is scripture interpret scripture. Revelation chapter 12 calls the devil that old serpent called the devil, all right? So he is found in Genesis chapter three, he comes to humanity and he tempts them with power. He says in Genesis three and five, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So we're in this mess now because of a fight over positions, a fight over titles and a fight over power. That's why there's death, that's why there's sickness. That's why there's disease. That's why there's so much greed and corruption that's happening in the world because it's a fight over power. Uh, it started in heaven. It was infiltrated into humanity. And up until now, 2018, it's still in humanity. And that's why there's so much corruption that's in the world. That's why you have wars. That's why you have rumors of war. That's why you have people starving. Do you know that there's enough food in the world to feed everybody? But because of greed and corruption, you know, my heart is just bleeding in regard. Are you all seeing about, and if you're watching this October 23rd, this is what's happening. And if you're watching it on YouTube after the fact, um, this would have passed. But there's over like two or 3,000 people that are coming from South America and trying their best to make it to the United States. And the reason they're trying to make it to the United States is because of all the greed and all of the corruption that is taking place in their nations. Literally what is ending up happening is that um, women are being raped, children are being abused, 
drug cartels have taken over and the people are saying we're sick of that. We've heard of a land to the north called the United States of America that's filled with all kind of opportunity and we want to go there and have an opportunity to do better for ourselves. Now, definitely, um, there are corrupt people that try to infiltrate groups like that, uh, making it into the um, U.S. But just consider, put yourself in their shoes for right now. You just want a better life. You like where you are, you love where you are, but you can't stay there because of the corruption. See, again, it's power. It's all about power. That's why there's so much that's going on in the world now. That's why there's corruption in so many nations. And don't just think that that corruption is in third world nations. As much as I love being in the United States of America, there is a lot that takes place in our nation that is very corrupt and it ends up hurting the people. And it's not just Donald Trump, okay? A lot of people are all up in arms about Donald Trump. Let me tell you what, when Donald Trump is long gone and off of the scene, there will still be that corruption because that human nature is infiltrated and it's infested with sin, with corruption, um, with hunger and thirst for power by any means possible, whoever it has to hurt. That's that sinful nature. That's why the message of sanctification is so important. When you get a chance, I don't have time to turn there, but when you get a chance, study Romans chapter six, where it talks about the death of the old man. That's what sanctification is all about. I believe it's the work of the devil that has distorted the message of sanctification and has caused the people to think that sanctification is just beating a tambourine, dancing and shouting and falling out all over the church. That's the furthest thing from what sanctification is all about. That's the furthest thing from what it's all about. You'll hear people say, this is a sanctified church and we're supposed to beat the tech. That is not what sanctification, sanctification has not the least bit to do with the tambourine, the least bit to do with the shout, the least bit to do with a um, hype service. It has nothing to do with that. Sanctification, Greek word hagiosmos, literally, it means a death of that sinful nature, an eradication of that sinful nature, a death of that old man. It literally means to be separated from sin and consecrated to God. Theologians, that condone sin and want to make it like sin is okay will say sanctification is nothing more than separation. That's a lie. That's a lie because sanctification is twofold. It's separation from sin and dedication and consecration to God. Just like the Israelites were brought out of Egypt, but they weren't just brought out of Egypt, they were brought into the promised land. And for those that would not change their nature, for those that did not uh, experienced the full work of sanctification, God said, I'm going to let you die right here in the wilderness because you're doubting me. Because you're doubting me, I swear you're not going to enter into my rest. And those individuals ended up dying in the wilderness. And he said, your children are going to be the ones that enter in because, again, sanctification is twofold. To be separated from sin and to be consecrated to God. Sanctification doesn't mean you beat the tambourine. Sanctification means you quit the sin business. Sanctification means your old man is dead. Sanctification means that you got new desires now. Yes, the enemy is going to tempt you. Yes, he's going to try you. Yes, he's going to try to pull you back. We all know that. But God, the Bible says, I pray that your first Thessalonians 5, 23, I pray that your whole body, soul, and spirit be sanctified holy. Bless you, Evangelist Brinkley, that it will be sanctified holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. That's what the message of sanctification is. And really, that's what's going to transform the world. Because everybody's running around talking about they're saved. Everyone's running around talking about even now that they're sanctified. I beat the tambourine, I play a guitar, I dance, I fall out, and I talk in tongues. Do you know that there's cults that talk in tongues? There are false religions that talk in tongues. There's people over in third world Middle Eastern countries that work themselves up into certain spells and take drugs and all and start talking in other languages. So talking in another language doesn't mean that you have been truly sanctified, which means that you've been sanctified is that you are dead to sin. Romans chapter six, what then shall we say to these things? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Because he that is dead is free from sin. God wants us to live free from sin. And when we live free from sin, you won't have all of the bickering and all of the division and all of the strife like you find 
now within the household of faith because if you're truly sanctified, you're gonna to wanna to be reconciled to your brothers and sisters and you're gonna do what the word says. Hebrews 12 and 14, notice, notice, I love this. In Hebrews 12, 14, we always focus on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. But did you read the whole first? Follow peace with all men and holiness. Do you know that following peace with all men is related to being holy? There is no such thing as you are holy and you're not trying to pursue to be at peace with all men. The Bible said, follow peace with all men. It didn't just say even in the church. It said all men, all right? Another passage said, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. When you are sanctified, you are a saint. Saint means holy one. We are called, the Bible says, to be saints. And when we are called to be saints, we're gonna do whatever is within us. And we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us to be peaceable. And the scripture even admonishes us in our prayer life to pray for those that are in authority, pray for kings and rulers, and all of those that are in authority that we might lead a godly, quiet, and peaceable life. Having peace, pursuing peace, that is all related to being sanctified. And so if you have someone that is just causing so much disruption in an organization, doesn't get along with anybody, something is wrong with that person's sanctification walk. Now they may, again, beat the tambourine and go, uh, you know, that, 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 that early, study about early holiness people in the scriptures and even in the early holiness movement. Now they would shout and dance as a result the Lord kept them saved all day and all that, but it wasn't about just the jumping and carrying on. And when you look at our time that we're in now, there's a form of godliness, but no power. And that is, let's just come to church and jump, 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 jump. You know, but like like I was always taught, you get a little baby and jump it all the time. It's not going to have good sense. Sometimes you need to sit still, hear some sound teaching, sit still and live right and do what's right and act right and treat people right and think right and have right motives and thoughts and intents in our heart because the enemy is doing everything he can to corrupt us. The Bible says, Peter told Jesus, he said, hey, I'm going to go with you all the way. If everybody else forsakes you. I'm not going to forsake you. Um, but he said, listen, Peter, Simon, Simon, the devil has asked for you, and he wants to destroy you. He wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to do you like wheat and throw you up and just completely tear you up. But I pray for you that your strength fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. And so that's why it's so important as we as the body of Christ stay together and stay strong. Bless you, uh, Supervisor Booker now. It used to be Taylor, now Supervisor Booker. Congratulations to you. Um, but we as saints have to stay together like never before. The days are getting more and more evil, and the enemy is more and more sinister. Now, like I stated in my Bible study tonight, I'm going to be dealing with the controversy that's going on now about the preacher talking about God, so-and-so, the devil. The devil is a God, so-and-so, liar, and all of that. I'm going to deal with it on the blog, but you all know how I deal with things is I deal with it scripturally, and I give you a balanced view. I don't sit up here and try to attack people and tear people down. I'm going to attack issues. I'm going to deal with issues, and you can deal with issues without getting personal. You don't have to attack the person because I'm, I have sense enough to know that what the devil wants to do is turn us on each other. When your physical body begins to attack itself, it's not long after that that you're going to die. And I see so much of that taking place where you have Christians, preachers attacking preachers. Christians, no one can attack a preacher worse than another preacher. I mean, I don't even think the devil himself, uh, and, and, and that's pretty bad, you know, because the devil can only be in one place at one time. So he's not doing half of the stuff that you all say he's doing. He's infiltrated humanity with that sinful nature, and he can sit back and watch us destroy and kill each other. But no one can destroy a preacher like another preacher. No one can destroy a Christian like another preacher. Christian. God forbid anyone does something like that. You're not truly sanctified. I'm just going to say you're not saved. You, you, you can't be saved. It's impossible for you to be saved and you're trying to destroy another person that God uh, has saved and that God, well, I don't like it. Well, there may be some things that, that people don't like about you. There may be some traits that you have that you need to, to get rid of and be delivered from. So the same way that we have mercy on ourselves, we got to have that same mercy towards other people. We have to be loving and forgiving. 
we can't oppress each other. That's one thing in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there was a whole lot of power struggle. And God chastised his people for oppressing other people. And one of the things he was concerned about was the oppressed. Isaiah 1 and 17, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. I don't hear none of these lying prophets nowadays saying anything like that. All I hear, and I, I don't, you know, if somebody comes and says they're a prophet, I'll call you that if that's what you say you are, if you say you're the Pope. Well, Hankerson, so-and-so is just as false, and you could, if whatever you tell me to call you, that's what I'm going to call you, okay? I'll, I'll call you. If you say you, you, you're, um, you're, you're a Diet Coke, I'm going to call you Diet Coke. That's what I'm going to call you, because that's what you said to call you, but it doesn't mean I believe it. And half of these folks that are saying they're prophets are not real prophets. And the reason I say that is not based on myself. It's just based on the word. Go to your Bible. Read the Bible and see what the prophets did. Listen at the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah. This is a real prophet. The real prophet was not just telling the people how to get wealthy, how they'll be blessed, how to get out of debt how to acquire more wealth and riches, but he dealt with them with their morality. Those prophets, Old and New Testament, dealt with morality. Yes, they foretold the future. Yes, they had the word of knowledge, word of wisdom and prophecy and all of that, and God would use them and show them different things. But when you listen at their message, their main message was people, you've got to repent and get back to God. That's why God raised up the prophets. You didn't have a whole lot of prophets uh, prior to the law, prior to the law being given, prior to the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, God's law, God's word, you see a rise in the prophetic ministry um, after the law was given and after the people failed to obey God. So prophets are a sign that people have left God. Prophets are a sign uh, and symbolic of the fact that God's people have turned away from him. And they're oppressing each other and, and they're unjust and they're not seeking for justice. So Isaiah says here as a real prophet, he says, you're not to use your wealth and your titles and your positions to destroy other people and tear other folks down. He says, learn to do right. I'm going to read it again. Isaiah 1 and 17. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. That's what real prophets and really the body of Christ is supposed to be concerned about. Psalm 99, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed and a stronghold in the times of trouble. So God is really concerned when people start trying to oppress other folks with their titles and positions and their power. Some of these pastors are nothing but cult leaders. Um, and I'm not calling out anybody in particular, because like I said, I don't attack uh, uh, people. I don't attack individuals. I don't get personal. I will attack issues, though. I will attack what is wrong. I will attack wrong teaching and wrong doctrine. Um, and, and your church should not be like a cult. Your church should not be totally focused on that man or that woman of God. Again, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason taught the preachers, get the people to God. That's what your job is. Get the people committed to God. You are the under shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the good shepherd, and you are the under shepherd, which has been given the awesome task and responsibility to tend to his people until he comes. The people are not there to make you wealthy. The people are now, if you get wealthy and get blessed, thank God. The people want to be a blessing to you, but that's not why they're there. They're not there for merchandise. They're not there. One preacher, and this grieved my spirit to hear it, one preacher um, asked for some money from uh, the, the people of God. They gave it, wasn't quite what he wanted, so he kept on. And so somebody came and told him, said, now we've, you know, got all the wool off the sheep that we can get. And uh, so he told him, he sent the people back, preachers back. He said, listen, I don't care what you got to do. Every little piece of wool, I want you to get it off of those sheep. You know, shame on you for having that kind of thought and mentality that the people of God are there to get me a nice car. The people of God are there to get me alligator shoes and $2,000 suits. If the people bless you with the $2,000 suit, alligator shoes, the, um, you know, two $300,000 car, so be it. Thank God for it. No problem. But that's not why they are there. They are not there just for your personal wealth. Um, the people in the church are not there as your personal harem. 
that you can sleep around with whoever you want to sleep. Well, Solomon, had, your name is not Solomon. And, and this is 2018. This is not that time. Or David had many wives. Your name is not David. If it is David, you're not from back then. Let me give you the Bible. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And so the church members are not there for you to just sleep around through, make babies and do everything that you want to do um, and don't think that you're uh, going to be judged for it. Whoremongers and adulterers, God is going to judge. And when people start oppressing God's people and just oppressing people in general, God gets really concerned about it. Jesus rebuked his disciples when it came to titles, position, and authority. He rebuked them because they wanted to lord it over each other. And he said in Luke, uh, well, let me read Luke and then Matthew. Luke 22, verses 25 to 27, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? the one who is at the table or the one who serves is not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as the one who serves. And then in Matthew 20, 25 through 28, he says, uh, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to serve, to come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here, here, here's basically how I feel. Um, I feel just treat everybody right. Because first of all, you 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 never know. And and I'm gonna say something. I'm saying this, this web. I'm really, ooh, I'm out there deep now. I might need to really drink some of this uh, uh, Coca-Cola Zero right now. But I'm just about to get deep here for a quick second. My children, Elijah, Raquel, and Matthew. Um, they have been in church and they know they can sit there, sit up there and tell you. Um, about everything in church. They're very observant. And one thing they told me one time really uh, troubled and bothered me. They said they were in a setting and there were some adults that were just so rude and so mean and so hostile to them. You know, you kids, what you doing sitting here and yada, 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 and all that kind of stuff. All right. But then when the people found out, oh, um, that's Bishop Hankerson. Well, I wasn't Bishop at that time, whatever I was, you know, I was, that's Hankerson's kids. Oh, this is so-and-so. And my kids were literally disgusted by it because they knew that those individuals were fake. Oh, if we're just any kid that's sitting here, you're going to treat us like trash. But if we're somebody that you feel like you can impress or somebody that can do something for you, and this is their kids, now all of a sudden you want to act all nice. Fake, phony, you're just fake and phony is what it is. And I preached on that in my annual address in the uh, Department of Evangelism official day in July in Indianapolis, Indiana. I don't have it on my page, but it's out there uh, somewhere on YouTube. You can look at the title was God is not impressed. And I said, I am not impressed by people that want to run and open up my door uh, it's raining. They want to run and put an umbrella over me because I'm the bishop. They want to make sure I get a drink of water. They want to make sure I get juice and all that kind of stuff. And I get first class treatment. I don't look at things like that. I'm watching how you're dealing with everybody else. So if you want to impress me by opening my door and making sure that I get into my car and making sure that I'm straight, but you're not making sure your family's taken care of or your family's watched over. So I'm a man. I, I, I was brought up by a man, Dr. Elijah H. Ankerson the first. I was trained by a man's man, Bishop T.L. Westbrook. And that's just how I was taught as a man. A man takes care of his family. Now, some of you think that's old fashioned. You're going to think I'm chauvinist or whatever like that. Um, but that's that's what was put in me. And it's not going to be taken out. As a man, it's my responsibility to make sure my family is taken care of before anything else. And I will make sure of that. That's one reason even being a pastor and a bishop and a national president and all of that, when the finances weren't what I thought that they should be, I worked a job for 17 years to make sure that they were uh, taken care of. And that's just how I was brought up. So I watch things like that. I watch things like that. 
you know, you you you're you've been to the barber, your hair is all straight and everything, and your 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 son's head so nappy, like I say, Moses couldn't part it. Something's wrong with that. Now, now if, if my kids' heads are nappy, you better believe mine is nappy right along with them like buckwheat. So if my hair is cut, their hair is cut. You know, my wife's hair is uh, 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 taken care of. Mine is taken care of. It's, that's that's how it is. Um, but I'm not going to sit up here and I'm all wealthy and do dabbed up in $2,000 suit and everybody else is so raggedy. Those are the kind of things that I watch and that I look at. And so I'm concerned. Um, how is it that you treat other people? How do you treat, um, you know, let, let me say this. Let's just step out here. They've called me a, what do they call me? I was recently called, it wasn't a troublemaker, something like that. Something they called me about on, um, uh, what do you call that thing when somebody's just an irritant, getting on somebody's nerves? It was something like that. Uh, and I forget what the term is. So since I'm an irritant and since I'm getting on people's nerves because I preach the truth, I might as well just step out there and get on more folks' nerves. I forget what the word is, but the nuisance, that's the word. Somebody called me that about two weeks ago. Someone else called me a false prophet on one of these um, social media sites. And then also about two weeks ago, I was called a nuisance you know you're just a nuisance hankerson out there you know dealing with these folks and their sins and everything leave these folks alone so you know since i'm a nuisance i um might as well get out there and uh and just go all the way uh with it but saints of god it's so important that we make sure that we take care of our business take care of our home take care of our family and one of the things that people have stated is this um they stated it in memphis and i'm going deep again i may need more than the coca-cola i might need the blessed oil as well um you know there's talk about going back to memphis whatever for convocation i'm not going to get into that that's that's above my pay grade that's not for me to deal with but let me say this um this week and next week the international department of evangelism is handing out 15,000 door hangers in the community of st louis starting tomorrow for those that want to join us 10 o'clock live center starting tomorrow night we're going to the uh nursing home minister harris you're on here help me with this um so the 23rd 24th 25th i believe it is so wednesday thursday friday the department of evangelism is going to the nursing homes we're in a nursing home revival this week next week the 29th we're going to the annie malone children's home and we're handing out 15,000 door hangers. We've been doing this uh, really ever since the convocation has been in St. Louis. Why is that? The reason why that is, is this. When Presiding Bishop Charles Edward Blake led us in the um, effort of moving to St. Louis, he was deeply, deeply concerned about what the citizens of Memphis, Tennessee were saying. Thank you so much, could put all that uh, information up there. Um, we as saints, we go to Memphis, we go to St. Louis, we go wherever, we have a great time. Bishop Blake heard what the citizens of Memphis were saying. I'm not talking about the church people. Now, if you think I'm not telling the truth, you pull up archives of the commercial appeal in Memphis, Tennessee, when it was announced that the convocation was leaving Memphis and going to St. Louis. Do you know what the people of the community said? They said, good riddance. We're so glad they're gone. Those are the meanest folks. Those are the cheapest folks. Those are the nastiest folks. Those folks are just exclusive and into themselves. They talk to each other. They don't talk to anyone else. And Memphis said, we don't feel welcome. Now, this is what was in the commercial appeal and what citizens were saying on social media at that time. Social media was kind of in its infancy stage but this is what was out. Bishop Blake stated, because he's an evangelist from his heart, um, he stated, we cannot come into a community with that kind of mentality. We've got to change that mentality. We've got to let the public know you are welcome to come and to worship with us in the church of God in Christ. And for those that would criticize him for saying that, well, you might as well criticize Jesus because Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and I'm lowly of heart, and you should find rest unto your souls. 
And so the invitation, the great invitation, the great commission is the great invitation for everyone to come and to be transformed, to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we do what we do. So wherever it is that we end up, St. Louis, Memphis, whatever, wherever it is, Church God in Christ, I'm going to be right there. A uh, little nuisance and all, whatever they want to call me. But anyways, um, we have to really watch how it is that we deal with the public. I have heard from people that work in hotels and restaurants that the saints, I'm just talking about Christians. I'm not talking about just Church of God in Christ. I'm talking about saints, Christian people are some of the worst people to serve. I have heard employers say that Christians are some of the worst people to employ. Um, I've heard people say that Christians are some of the worst people to serve as tenants. You know, well, the Lord has me here in this apartment. I'll pay you rent, you know, two months from now. We got to take care of our responsibility. We've got to be spoken well of within and without. And so it's important that we do as Jesus said here and realize we didn't come to be served. We've come to serve. Those are the things that he is looking at. The apostles taught that humility is the way. Humble yourselves, 1 Peter 5 and 6, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. As I wrap this up, and I'm going to get any questions that you might have at the end. As I wrap this up, let me get into some racial issues. Black people historically in the United States of America um, were oppressed. Um, the most that you were as a man was uncle. The most that you were as a lady was mammy. Other than that, you were boy. And for those of you that are in this new generation and say that was 100 years ago, uh, wakey, wakey. Um, in the early 70s, with me coming up, there were people that would refer to you as boy. I remember there was almost a fight in the neighborhood when a white man called one of the, uh, my black schoolmates a boy. And uh, I mean, they were ready to light the house on fire. It was that bad. Uh, but what's so big about being a boy? Put yourself in somebody else's shoes and in their context. And I'm going to deal with that issue also in the future in regard to the racism that you find within Christianity. Um, and it's not always overt racism as far as doing something against you. Sometimes it's a refusal um, to be compassionate and to put yourself in someone else's shoes and see what it is that they're dealing with. Uh, that is not Christ-like because Jesus put himself in our place and died on the cross for us. And when we fail to do that, we are not acting like Jesus. I don't care how big your church is. I don't care how many television stations that you're on. I don't care how many millions of dollars that you're bringing in and how many folks that you're feeding all around the world. If you have that kind of mentality, uh, you are not Christ-like at all. That is not like Jesus Christ. And we're seeing a lot of that within um, Christianity. And so I'll be dealing with that. So the Jim Crow laws and things like that brought a whole lot of oppression to black people. The church was the only place where many black people could receive um, any type of significance, any type of respect. There were positions, there were titles, there was authority. Uh, in the world, you might have been boy, but here at church, you're deacon so-and-so, you're elder so-and-so, you're reverend so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, bishop so-and-so. And so I want this new generation to have patience with the older generation. The new generation says, we ain't in the titles, you can call me Bob, you can call me whatever. If you have somebody that's from an older generation that comes out of that um, era where there was all of that disrespect, don't call them by their first name. Call them at least Mr. So-and-so, Bishop so-and-so, whoever uh, they are, because they're coming from a totally different era. Again, for the newer generation, you got to know your history. If you don't know your history, you're going to repeat your history. And for those that think that we're so far away removed from Jim Crow laws and all that, just look at all of what's happening in society right now. Look at all these people calling the cops on black people for barbecuing in the, you know, park and all that. Well, you know, the regulations and the rules. Look at what just happened in St. Louis. What are you doing coming into this building? I mean, pay attention to what's going on. OK, so don't down the older generation because they're not used to you calling them Susie or Bob or whatever. At least give them the respect of Mr. So-and-so or misses so-and-so, you know, because that's the era that they came out of. And we must understand each other. And when we understand each other, then, of course, we can work together, united to make a difference um, in society. And I understand where the younger people are coming from. They're not into all of that. They could care less. So I don't, using the term that we used to use years ago, I don't trip over that. I don't trip off of that. 
So if you don't get all up in arms because I'm the bishop and I walk in and, oh, you give me my uh, props and all of that, that doesn't move me. I'm not bothered by that because I understand this generation. But I also understand that there's a certain amount of reverence and respect that you should have for people that are in authority, um, for whoever that might be, for, for women, uh, for children, for school teachers, uh, for preachers, um, and things like that, law enforcement. And believe you me, there's a lot of people in law enforcement, and that's a whole different lesson altogether, that are very corrupt. I've been racially profiled before, but I don't just treat every cop you know, with disrespect because I have been racially profiled before. I was walking through a neighborhood one night, and they called the cops on me. There's a black man walking through the neighborhood. Cop came up, put your hands on the um, car. And I looked at him like, no, you didn't. And he looked at me like, yes, I did. And I looked at him like, well, it's going to be some trouble here today because I am not about to put my hands on no uh, uh, car talking about, you know, wh what are you doing in this neighborhood and all of that. So, um, yeah, pray for him. But anyways, uh, those, those are the things that we need to do to understand each other. Now, here's what we can do as I uh, wrap this up. Number one, here's five principles. Be confident in who you are regardless of what your status is in life. So if you don't have the position or title that you want, um, be confident in who you are and trust God that maybe he'll give it to you one day. And if he doesn't, so be it. You are important because of who you are in Christ. Number two, live the type of life that earns and demands respect. So let your name mean something. Let your life mean something so that when you walk in, uh, when you come into the midst of the people, they respect you because of how you carry yourself. Number three, respect other people, whether they're high or low, if they're little kids. You don't know whose kids those are. They could, that could be you know, some big senator's kids. That could be a judge's kids. That could be the bishop's kids. You never know. Uh, don't, don't look at how raggedy somebody looks. You, know, you never can tell who that is. Treat everybody correctly. That's right. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. My kids have found out there's a whole lot of favor they get just from yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, ma'am. No, sir. Because people can't believe young people that know how to talk with respect, young people that have some respect. So don't, you know, this is a new new day, a new society, and I'm not into all that. Well, fine. You're going to be stuck exactly where you are. But if you want to progress in life, there's certain principles that you have to follow to progress. Number four, aspire high and strive lawfully. There's nothing wrong with desiring a position or an office. What's wrong is if the motive is wrong. OK, somebody told me one time they uh, were saying something about me becoming a bishop. I think I just became a bishop. This was about three years ago. I said, oh, I'm not into that. I'm not into that. They say, OK, yeah, if you weren't into it, you wouldn't accept it. I said, well, you got a point right there because I did accept it. I did accept the consecration. I did accept the office of bishop in the Lord's church, office of bishop in the church of God in Christ. So there's nothing wrong with aspiring high. Why do we tell kids when they're young, you can be anything you want to be? You can be the president, you can be a doctor, you can be a bishop, you can be a supervisor, you can be a lawyer, you can be all those things. We tell young people they can be whatever they want to be, but then as soon as that child gets older and enters into adulthood and says, this is what I want to be, we start attacking them. Well, you just think that you're all of that. So there's nothing wrong with aspiring to wanting something more out of life. Just do it lawfully. I mean, that's one of the first rules in politics if you're running for a political office you know you can't be mealy mouth about it hey i'm john doe and i'm running for senator of the united states of america you know be confident in that there's nothing wrong with that but there is something wrong when you try to destroy and tear down other people because of a title or an office finally number five always seek to maintain a good name and of course i stated that before so thank you all so much i want to take some questions at this time and i really want you to share this uh video please don't forget that i need you to uh join us the department of evangelism on tomorrow which is uh what day is today today is tuesday on wednesday all these days run together i woke up in a hotel room one time and i said where am i at i don't even know what city i'm in um but this is um this is, yes, this is Tuesday. And so on Wednesday morning, the Department of Evangelism will begin the uh, commence the activity of handing out 15,000 door hangers. Those of you that have questions, you can start to put those in their uh, comment section right now, um, even on Periscope. On Periscope, I'm going to keep track of you because your questions disappear, so I have to answer them real fast.
uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night, the Department of Evangelism will be in a uh, nursing home revival. We're going to a nursing home every night this week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, of course, Friday, I will be in Louisville, Kentucky, preaching for Administrative Assistant Gabriel Hatcher. So those in the Kentucky area, please join me. And then on the 29th, uh, we are going to the Annie Malone uh, Orphanage, the Annie Malone Children's Home. So evangelism is ministering to the widows, ministering to the less fortunate, and even ministering in the orphanage. This coming Friday at 12 noon Central Time, the Bishop John Shear, Chairman of the Board of Bishops, will be leading uh, us in a noonday prayer time as a part of the 11 11 40, which our presiding bishop, Charles Everett Blake, has called us to. 11 minutes of our prayer time is to be used for uh, 11 petitions that he is asking for God to bless uh, with our upcoming Holy Convocation. On Friday, November the 2nd, we're going to Memphis, Tennessee uh, for a prayer time from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. in the prayer room at Mason Temple. This is the Department of Evangelism. We're going um, to Mason Temple Friday, November 2nd. That's the Friday before convocation. And Mother Frances Kelly is going to be leading us in a prayer time there uh, at Mason Temple in the prayer room. So I'll be in Memphis uh, two times in the next upcoming week, this coming Saturday. Uh, yeah, this coming Saturday. No, this coming Sunday. Let me get those dates right. I will be at the Temple of Deliverance, Church of God in Christ, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock there in Memphis, Tennessee. That's right, yes. And um, I'll be ministering for Bishop Milton Hawkins in the 11 a.m. service there at Bountiful Blessings, well, that's how we know it, Bountiful Blessings in Memphis, Tennessee, and then we'll be back in Memphis November the 2nd for the uh, prayer time uh, with Mother Frances Kelly. So try to keep track of all of that. If you pay attention to my page and the evangelism page, you know, I always have announcements on here, uh, then you can find out more about that. All right, questions, comments on titles and positions. Let me take about 10 minutes to do this before I go into Bible study, because when I go into Bible study tonight, uh, my lesson is dealing, I got it right here, I'm going to be dealing with this um, sermon that is uh, hitting the airwaves now on the devil is a uh, blank, blank liar. Uh, I'm going to be dealing with that because I think it's really, and I, I'm not reactionary. I don't do a lot of reaction to everything that happens on social media. Some things are just um, uh, not even worth mentioning that you see on social media but some things really are teaching opportunities and people need teaching more so now than ever in 2018 because one of the signs of the last days is going to be uh, false teaching, uh, false prophets, uh, false doctrine. So I'll be dealing with that. Pay attention to my blog. There's going to be some information on that a little bit later on. Every time I turn around dot blogspot dot com, you can see information on there. Bless you, Brother Davis. Thank you so much. I thank you for your support. I appreciate it so much. Uh, comments, questions, comments, questions. Minister Harris is please saying, please come and join us at the Nursing Homes. Bless you, District Elder Eddington. We appreciate you. Thank you, Sister Young, for your support. Thank you, uh, Sister Webb. You've been a support for Lord knows well over 20 years, and we appreciate you um, so much, you and your husband being faithful members of the Life Center um, International Church. But again, people fight over titles for various reasons, and I think this lesson will be a blessing. Here's what I want you to do. I don't ask people um, for financial donations. If you do that, thank you, Lord, for Jesus. I, I do receive that. I, there are people that do it. I'll be um, uh, leaving out of my office, and ping, the cash app goes off. I'm like, thank God for Jesus. I appreciate that. But here's how you can sow into this ministry, how you can sow into this ministry, uh, Ministry of Assistant Riley, is by sharing this video with other people. Share it all over social media because I believe that as you share the truth of God's word, uh, then the people can be blessed. All right, let's get some questions here. Well, Joseph Anderson asked this, Bishop, do you mentor young men in St. Louis on the Bible and church protocol? Um, I don't really have a mentoring program in a sense where you can sit down with me or whatever, but um, there are people all around the nation that have my number and anyone that knows me, I wanna see in the comment section, does Hankerson answer the phone? 
let you all put it in the comment section if Anchor snatches is the phone. Um, I do a lot of texting, and that's how I'm able to communicate with so many people and deal with so many responsibilities. Um, and there are people all across the country that will text me, that will inbox me, ask me various questions in regard to the Bible, in regard to protocol. Someone just did that today. And most people know that I love the scriptures. I love discussing the um, Bible. I love the church. Um, definitely love Jesus. That's what it's all about. Um, and so I'll talk text into my text box or into my messenger and give answers. And so that's really the most practical way as far as me mentoring. But as far as having a program and just hanging out and everything, I really don't even have time myself to hang out myself. But I'm, I'm going to tell you what, saints of God, if I can make it till after this convocation, my God, today, if I can make it till after this convocation, I am going to find myself someplace in a holy sanctified vacation. That's right. From the holy convocation to the holy vacation, my God today, God is going to do it for me. And he has made the way, and um, I just need to have the time, and I'm setting up the time. Thank God for all the wonderful invitations that are coming in. I have preaching invitations from now all the way up until all into the end of 2019. And it's a blessing, and I thank God for the open doors. But I am going on a holy vacation and taking my family with me. And I'm like the song, though. If my mama don't go, I can't tell you. <laughs> if my father don't go, I, I'm walking up the King's Highway. And so because I don't really have all of that uh, time, uh, my family used to do that all the time, two vacations a year, summer and winter. Kids got older, more responsibilities came about, so we've kind of gotten away from it. But we're going to be getting into that if I can make it past, not, not if. When I make it past this, Holy Convocation, I'm going on the Holy Vacations. What I would encourage you to do, if there's questions or comments that you have in regard to those topics, text me or inbox me. Um, even though my phone number is all over social media, I don't just like to put it out uh, on online like that. I think it is even on my Facebook page on the profile. But just inbox me if you don't have my number, and I'll be glad to give you my number, and we can uh, text. All right. Uh, Janice Nelson, is it really necessary to use profanity to get your points across? No, no, no. And that's what I'm going to deal with in my uh, subject matter. Some people, oh, okay, I thought it was a fight going on. This the saints starting prayer in the, <laughs> in, the, in the sanctuary, fighting the devil. That's it. Somebody's fighting somebody, but that's, that's the saints in there praying. Um, but uh, yeah, for the spiritual warfare taking place. But no, I do not believe that it is um, necessary. Um, some people feel like that's being for real, and that's really reaching out to this generation. Um, but you know what ends up happening? You give an inch, they're going to take a mile. And so if you do it across the pulpit, then that means you can imagine what will happen outside. <laughs> of the pulpit. So no, it is not necessary to get your point across. It's actually considered ignorant is what it is because people that are educated or astute um, would definitely look down on something like that. And they think those of us that are quote unquote Pentecostal, sanctified, spirit filled, Holy Ghost filled, they think we're cultic and crazy anyways and not um, properly theologically trained. So when we do things like that, and you remember, they've been doing that for years. The message, uh, watch them dogs, you know, who the so-and-so left the gate open and all that kind of thing. And bring your so-and-so to church, talking about the foal of a donkey. Um, you know, people have preached that message. Um, it, it, it gets folks' attention, but it, it, it's, it's more negative than it is uh, positive. You, you push more people away than the folks that you actually uh, bring in. And people are going to root for it because what it does, it condones what they're doing. Okay, if Reverend did it, then I'm okay. Elder did it, then I'm okay. And so that's why people love things like that. But if you tell them that it's wrong, then they're not going to be as open uh, as, as open to it. Brother Anderson, is it legal for a church to have three pastors? Um, you would have to kind of break that down to me because um, your average large church does have multiple pastors on staff. 
And what I mean is you'll have a senior pastor, you may have an assistant pastor, you may have a, a youth pastor, a children's pastor, a music and arts pastor, um, nurse and home pastor. Um, so larger churches do have a pastoral staff, but I really have to have a lot more detail on what you mean by that as far as more than one pastor. Um, Cause really when the body of Christ started and the church got started, Jesus did not fully establish a church government. He appointed apostles, but he left and he left the Holy Ghost in charge. And then eventually church government began to develop with deacons and, and uh, different officers like that. And so originally when the church started, every congregation was overseen by an apostle that oversaw multiple congregations. And then that apostle would appoint um, an assistant to help him, like Paul had Timothy and Titus. And then those assistants were to ordain elders and deacons in every church. And so it was a group of individuals that would oversee the day-to-day -day affairs of a local church, that assistant to the bishop, help the bishop to oversee those churches, or assistant to the apostle rather, and those assistants to the apostles were called bishops eventually. And of course the apostle oversaw the whole thing. So church government um, eventually evolved. So again, I would have to know what you mean by um, three pastors. If it's a multiple pastoral staff, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, you know, if you have a senior pastor, of course, obviously, um, as far as your question, is it legal? Uh, that would be legal in the sense that the senior pastor is the president of the corporation. Then you have a vice president. Then you have your board of um, directors, your chairman of the board and all of that. Well, listen, thank you all so much. I appreciate you. Thank God for each and every one of you. I could go on and on, but I need to drink me some Diet Coke Zero with zero sugar, zero calories before I go into, ooh, that, 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 ooh, that looks good. That looks good. I wish it had some cherry in it. What I really like is, is, is Pepsi Zero with cherry in it. That's the best thing. So I'm going to get this before I go into Bible study. Those of you that are in St. Louis, come and join me. Thank God for those of you all that came and joined me uh, Sunday night. I just made a little statement, and there were saints came all the way from Alton, Illinois, to be with us in service. I appreciate that. God brought me through on Sunday. It was a wonderful time. I preached at 8 o'clock for Dr. E.G. Shields at Mount Beulah Baptist Church. God moved. Dr. Shields danced a little bit, too. 10 o'clock, I preached for um, uh, Reverend Earl Nance. Uh, Greater Mount Carmel Baptist Church, Lord moved in there in a great way. Four o'clock, Superintendent Daniel Peterson preached for him and then came back to my own church, Life Center International, on Sunday night. And the Lord blessed us with a powerful miracle testimony on that night. And it was uh, tremendous. So uh, God is moving. I'm getting ready to teach now at the church I love and pastor, Life Center. Okay, you're a pastor appointed by your bishop but you have two older brothers who told you that they are co-pastors. Um, you have to break that down to me because if the bishop appointed you as the pastor, then you are the pastor of the church and you are the one that appoints whoever else to serve as your co-pastor or assistant pastor, unless the bishop appointed them as co-pastors. Now, if the bishop says, all right, Anderson, you're the pastor, and I'm putting John Doe and Jim Roberson in as co-pastors, then you have to really go along with that because the bishop is overseeing that um, congregation. But if the bishop duly appointed you as the pastor of the church, um, and for those of you that are on Periscope, the gentleman has asked the question, is it legal for a church to have three pastors? He was appointed as pastor by his bishop, but there are two older brothers who told him, mm, wow, that they are the co-pastors of the church. Well, again, if the bishop duly appointed you as the pastor and didn't give you any instructions as far as appointing other officers, um, there's no one in the church that can come and tell you what their position is because authority is delegated. Um, and it would be to you to appoint whoever your co-pastors or assistant pastors or people are. Um, so that sounds like a difficult situation uh, that's there that you have those individuals that have done that. And so you have to um, Use the wisdom of the word of God. It's easy to walk in now and say, I'm the head person in charge and 
here's how it's going to be. You have to watch that in 2018. When you come telling people, if you don't like the way I like run things, hit the door, you can leave. In 2018, folks will leave. So get up and tell your congregation that I run this. I run this. I'm the head person in charge. I run this. And if you don't like it, you can leave. In 2018, and I know in St. Louis, um, they will get up and walk out and say, hey, all right, then you have it. Then your thing, do what you want to do. So, um, yeah, uh, no, no one is to tell you that you, you put them in position. Okay, they were never appointed. Yeah, so they, they cannot serve in those offices unless you have um, appointed them. But here's what you have to look at, Brother Anderson. What do the bylaws of your church say? How is your church structured? How is it set up? A lot of people in um, this time do not pay attention to their paperwork. And then when they get into difficulty to see a church, there's the business side. And uh, people think just come along, fast and pray, shout and dance and all. But if that business side is not together and controversy comes in, um, if a lawsuit happens, first thing the attorneys are going to say is, what do your bylaws say? So what do your bylaws say according to the bylaws? Does the pastor have the authority to appoint um, officers in that church? Does, is the bishop the one that's supposed to appoint the officers? So if they never were appointed, always make sure that your bylaws back you up in dealing with that situation because they may be able to pull out something from the bylaws and say, hold up just a minute, according to our constitution, all officers in this church are supposed to be voted on by the members in good standing in the congregation. And then you're in trouble then because according to those bylaws, it would mean that they're supposed to uh, be the ones that make the decision the congregation is. So what do your bylaws say? If your bylaws, you know, if you don't have bylaws, then you need to um, uh, have the consultation of godly people and an attorney and have your congregation to ratify those bylaws, not just you and just your board, but your congregation as well. That helps to protect the integrity um, of that house because um, legally speaking now, or um, the government is not just looking at you, uh, what you made up or what your board made up, but what is that congregation saying? Because you've had so many pastors that have taken advantage of these congregations and they wanna make sure that everything is above board. And so what do your bylaws say? Now I know the average person listening, what does the Bible say? When you get into a lawsuit and when there's a power struggle, um, those attorneys are going to be looking at what do the bylaws say, because again, there is a business side. Okay, so if your bylaws say one pastor, that's your answer right there. According to the bylaws, there's one pastor. And um, does it say that the pastor appoints those individuals or they're um, elected? That's the next question. So if it says that officers are appointed, that answers it. If it says that they're elected, then what would end up having to happen either um, the co-pastors would have to have been appointed by the pastor or voted on by the congregation. All right. So stick with your bylaws and then stick with the Bible in the sense the Bible tells you how to deal with people. OK, you don't want to just come in and destroy those gentlemen because they may have influence with other members in the congregation. And so with them having influence with other members, um, other members may be looking up to them. You may have somebody that just joined the church and they look up the elder. Uh, Sand Ballot, you know, well, I'm not calling the person Sand Ballot, but you know what I'm saying, Elder um, John Doe. And so then you go to destroy Elder Son John Doe, and the new person in the church has no idea why you're doing that. And they're looking like, well, you know, pastor's just a, a, a dictator. I'm going to go to another church. So you have to really watch how you deal with cases like that. This is not 1940, where you can just get up across the pulpit and say whatever you want to say to people and handle church matters across the uh, pulpit. Matters really need to be handled in the office or in a duly called meeting to deal with such subjects. Um, I'm about to get off because one of my members is really cutting up here, Sister Regina Oscar Sullivan. I'm calling you out. Okay, that's the end of the Bible study right now because Life Center members are cut. You can't trust the, I can't take these members. No place. Life Center International Church of God in Christ. Saints, will you please pray for the saints? Pray for Life Center. Pray for Life Center because these saints are hilarious. It is never a dull moment. I will be in in just a uh, second. True, I've been there 13 years of preaching. Bless you so much. All right, God bless you, saints. I appreciate you. Until next time, spread this video, spread the love of Christ. 
every time we turn around, God is blessing us. God bless you, Facebook. All right, we're getting ready also to end on Periscope and this.